Uh, welcome. Welcome. Thanks for coming. It's, it's 12 noon. High noon. Time for LA2M. Good morning. Time to start. Time to start, yes. And uh, my name is Derek Marabon. I'm here with Stacy Collick. And we are, well, we're representing, well, Stacy is from Dollarville, Dollarville Printing. So if you have any printing, call her. But she's also the treasurer of LA2M. Uh, Lunch and Hour Marketing is a 501c3 nonprofit. And so we focus on marketing education, right? So that's why you guys get to come out and listen. And, um, and we're also live streamed. Uh, Roger Rail is filming this, and you can watch it at slash live. So I'm sure we have people watching. We have a big following in Iceland, which is very interesting. I don't know why they. But um, so, anyways, they're, gonna, they're in for a treat today. So Stacy passes the hat. We often uh, suggest maybe a donation of $3 if you want to donate, and that goes to fund our expenses for LA2M. Uh, also, Bob Ferran sponsored our newsletter this month. Thanks, Bob. He's a photographer if you need one. All right, so he's not going to So, uh, is there anything here for your very first time to LA2M? One, two, okay, a few, a few newcomers. Okay, a few newcomers. So just so you all know, we have a pretty large LinkedIn group um, with about a thousand members, so feel free to join our LinkedIn group. Uh, there's some good connections can be made there. We also have a Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing Facebook page, right, which is pretty standard. But please feel free to connect in both those places. And if you sign in this morning, you'll get our weekly newsletter with all of our updates on speakers and who's coming and all that. Um, so that, that's a good way to stay in touch. Uh, and again, my name is Derek Fairman, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. And uh, I actually have some friends here today. Well, one of my friends is a speaker who came in from Boston. And he's going to put on a real show with a couple other friends. Uh, Jason Bryan came in, uh, some fellow Spartans. So we have a little Spartan posse up here. <laughs> and we're all, we're all in the same fraternity, which is kind of interesting. On uh, five Captain Tom, which is no longer at MSU, but, but when we were there, it was a really big, you know. Any reason that it's no longer there? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but it was, it was good times, good times. Um, so, but anyway, so my friend Matthew, who just also happens to be, uh, you know, the, the speaker, he uh, he points out to me that you know he won cranes under forty under forty at age thirty two. He asked me what took so long. <laughs> for me to win because I want a 38. But, uh, you know, he's, he's in Boston. He's doing big things. He is the founder of Motorola Ventures, which was the venture capital organization for Motorola, like the uh, phone people. And he um, did that for a while. He started his own uh, venture company, Rudyard Partners, where they fund startups. Uh, he also started his own company called Isabella Products, which makes a very cool progressive uh, device where you can actually send photos to it and it's like a, a third screen in the home. So my in-laws have one, and we send photos down there of the kids, and it's, it's easy for them to use, because all they have to do is plug it in, and they can see nice slideshows of family. And we can manage it all for them from a computer, which is very nice. So he's, he's done some really cool things. You know, he always tells me about these trips he takes to Asia, where he explores the latest technologies for mobile and uh, technology devices. So he really knows more than, than the average bear. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, and he's doing really well. So, anyways, he's going to talk today about taking a bite out of Apple, which I think he's personally doing a little bit, you know. And uh, and then he'll help you take bites out of Apple. And um, why don't you give a round warm, warm applause to uh, Matthew Browning? We're getting them wired for sound here. If you just thought we could turn it off, we need to. Is this all right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Derek and um, LA2M for the invitation. I was uh, on the calendar for last week, but. Um, I was in a deposition for a lawsuit, and so uh, I really wish I was here last week. <laughs> um, that's okay. So I'm not the subject of either party, and, and, and so I, I did my thing. Um, Derek asked me to, if I'd be uh, willing to come out and share my story about starting a company. Um, I am a founder of, of two um, successful investment programs, one being Motorola. Um, and so when I left, it was a half a billion dollar portfolio I built from scratch. And 
including some very, very cool consumer companies like Sport Vision, which many of you may never have heard of, but you all know it because it's the yellow line for football. Um, or the glowing puck, which arguably was a loser. Uh, or the strike zone for all playoff baseball in ESPN. And so that and um, a company called FinSense, which many of you never heard of, is the link between Nike and Apple called Nike Plus. And so I made a, a history of, of really focusing on consumer technology investments, not infrastructure or back office equipment or enterprise, but really understanding people, um, user interfaces, industrial design, consumer products. And along the way, I was fortunate to make investments in companies like Ink, which is now every Kindle screen or every former uh, e-book is an e-ink display. These are all technology companies that I was fortunate to invest in and learn really about uh, how do you uh, create a wow experience. Um, over the course of that time, I really got kind of the itch of building my own company. So you, you, many cases you see venture capitalists or investors who they come to board meetings and they pontificate and they make commands and they make these great observations. And although many of them were entrepreneurs, they were entrepreneurs in like the 30s or the 40s or when there was no SEO. They don't necessarily understand kind of the dichotomy of today's marketing, today's product, today's buyers, today's consumers, today's demographics, and perhaps when they were running the fifth largest operator in the Caribbean in the 60s. And so that level of disconnect, I've always found kind of intriguing, and I really wanted to make sure that as someone who's an investor and runs my own fund, that I actually understood what it meant to be a CEO, what it really meant to be an entrepreneur. And very rarely will you ever find a venture capitalist or a managing partner decide to go into becoming a startup CEO. Usually it just doesn't happen because a venture capitalist collects a management fee and he goes to the islands a couple times a year and he lives a high life and there's somewhat of a, of a, of a disincentive for him to do too much work if he's getting a steady paycheck in the form of a management fee. Myself, after I left Motorola, I eventually started my own fund, which is called Red Blue Partners. It's a $125 million fund, and we all we invest as a consumer. We are early stage, so we don't invest in 92 rounds of capital or companies that raise you know, $400 million. We invest in companies that either as first money, second money, and we also do um, co-investing with family offices. So we're very much at the granular level. We write checks anywhere from 50000 up to $5 million. So we want to be as flexible learning about the idea. But again, along that way, about two years ago, after I, within two months of launching the fund, I wanted to, this, to launch my own mobile device company. And that's the story of Isabella. And as we kind of thought about Isabella and how to build Isabella, we really wanted to kind of aspire to be the greatest. And our kind of Isabella analogy is we'd love to be the, the, the marriage of a Bose and an Apple. And so coming from New England, Bose is big. Bose is known for doing singular or vertical things extremely well, an extraordinarily compelling brand. They don't deviate too far afield from high infidelity. And then of course, Apple is Apple. So we started our journey in Isabella, um, which is um, named after my six-year-old daughter, uh, two and a half years ago. And so for the, for the next bit of time, all of this will be about Isabella and kind of the, the journey that we've taken over the last few years in building a company that's now um, you know, shipping product, revenue, launching new products, and has um, big, um, kind of exciting things on the horizon. So first I'll play this little clip. There was, we are fortunate enough to have a documentary that's been filmed about Isabella over the last two years. And the documentary is being, um, is in rough cut, but they were kind enough to send us the trailer for a uh, um, film festival submission that blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know really what it is. All I said is, can you give me two minutes? And, and so this is a two minute clip about kind of Isabella. Who's in Florida? And who's in Chicago? My parents always said that they don't feel like grandparents because they never see their grandchildren. And that the way to curb that would be to come out here more. And I 
Douglas said, no way. This sounds like a problem I can solve with technology. I go around to the CEO, sound the vision. Then I come home here, the office, and it's a box of parts, and they got price tags on them, and they're writing more checks, and they're telling me I need to do it. There's always risks, right? I mean, there's always, when you launch a new innovative product, you know, you're a pioneer, and what happens to pioneers is you take some arrows, right? 2008 budget. <laughs> <laughs> How do you design that product? Right after we deliver our first visit, we're going to crack open this tequila. So we, uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, <laughs> Um, so we started out in uh, February of, of 2008 to build what we call one of the world's first mobile internet device companies. So um, it, mobile internet device or the mid category is, a, is becoming a consumer term over the next year or two. And it encompasses everything that's on the mobile network that's not a phone and not a netbook. So that's e-readers, that's navigation devices, that's tablets. That's actually toys that now have cellular devices in them. That's photo frames like Visit. There's a whole host of uh, estimated 10 billion new devices that will ship between now and 2020 that are not phones, that are not computers, that are all talk to the cellular network. And those are meter reading, toys, jewelry, you name it. There are entrepreneurs around the world that are using the cellular network to connect their stuff. Binoculars, necklaces, you name it. And so Isabella's core proposition is we connect the unconnected. We take things like a photo frame, add cellular connectivity, and now you can take a picture here, send it to the frame in California, and the picture shows up in two minutes. Or you're able to see a, 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 an exciting giant bear in the wildlife, you take a picture, uh, snap it with your binoculars, and the image is posted wherever within two minutes. All that cellular connectivity is what Isabella monetizes, manages, and creates a, a wild experience. But part of it for me was, I'm going to build a mobile device company. It means I'm going to build a hardware company. And so part of it is, are you actually prepared for this? When, when I started my startup, I said to myself, you're going to actually build a hardware company. Isn't hardware restricted for just Asia? Who actually builds hardware anymore in the United States? And, and it's a great question. Companies like Motorola and, and other big traditional U.S. consumer electronics companies like Kodak have always struggled to find economies of scale in manufacturing and even designing to some extent and developing <coughs> consumer products here in America. And so for us it was a gut check. You, you have to understand kind of the capital, capital requirement for putting together a business around that business model of building hardware. And there's also the, the notion of starting from scratch, which was I sat in an office by myself and had to figure out whether or not I had the metal to build a mobile device company. And I'm sure many of you who have started a startup or are in the process of starting a startup sit in your office by yourself and say, am I really ready to do this or would it be easier to go to Craigslist or the Wannans and find a job? The reality is, is most of us find that we want to become entrepreneurs. We want to control our own destiny and we want to be CEOs and leave an imprint in our field, our industry, or our technology. And so for us, creating a new industry meant really understanding are we going to be ready to launch a successful company and actually create a successful company. And that comes down to selecting folks. It came down to picking out the right business model and obviously creating an environment where we can capitalize ourselves and be able to demonstrate success over the course of the journey. When we thought about, well, what are we going to actually make? You know, people always use different analogies like, is it a nice to have or is it a need to have? And, and there's some truth to that. But I also think other ways to, to ask it is, um, 
that, you know, or, or to, to characterize what you want your new business to do is say, look, it better be awesome or it better make a difference. And that's what we kind of look at is we think some of parts of our product or our features are awesome. But we also think it makes a difference. And so in the case of Visit, we believe it, make, we believe it makes families stay closer together. We believe it allows and encourages them to frequently share content amongst themselves between different demographics. So folks who may not be Facebook people, but folks who do use Facebook, being able to put them together in a solution that allows them to share content, photos, images, etc. And so I put this up here because when I was in Germany last year on a business trip, I saw that they sell colonnades, like year round. You could go into a grocery store in Berlin and buy colored eggs. And I thought, wow, that's actually kind of cool because, you know, I, I like colored eggs. It's someone who followed the Easter Bunny. But then I realized, wow, I, no one else does this. And maybe there's a reason why no one else does this. It's because, you know, people don't understand what colored eggs mean or they don't think it's that exciting or they think it's kind of a... Uh, a, a, a niche or it's kind of a fad and so part of it is, is even though there's maybe an initial visceral impact to your new product or your new idea at the end of the day it's still either better be awesome or it better make a difference and that is again to a customer or to a target demographic one of the biggest challenges that people come up with when they start their new business is uh, how do I fund it and so my kind of story about this is rich people are, well, they're rich, and they're everywhere. And so from a funding perspective, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding um, about how do I get my business funded. Some entrepreneurs believe that I have to go in front of the venture capital community and start pitching my plan and start pitching my idea. And the reality is, is today in this economy, 2010, going into 2011, it is probably far more prudent for you to take the angel, rich person, family office, uh, grant, or private funding uh, solution or option than it is to go into venture capital or financial institutional uh, rounds of financing. And there's several reasons for that. One is there are a whole host of individuals who are successful business people who believe in giving back in financing in, in the form of $50,000 convertible notes, $100,000 convertible notes, $200,000 convertible notes. And they're actually very excited to be part of your plan. They're, being, they're very excited to participate. There are also um, family offices that have come together more now than they ever have in the past two decades as a way to grow their wealth. And so the sophistication of high net worth people has increased greatly where they've actually created their own investment office. And some of those offices are run by professionals, but they're small and they're geared again towards investing smaller amounts in newer companies. And again, that is a better fit for you than going to a venture capital firm that wants to put out three or four million, but your valuation is only four million, so now they own 90% of your company. And so what we always try to do is try to think about how are we able to pair ourselves with the maturity of our company with what we're willing to part with our company. And part of it ends up being incremental. So for the first year at Isabella, we funded our company on a bi-monthly basis. Every two months, we wrote a check or raised money up to around $220,000. And so we were very thin. And what we had to do is every time we raised two twenty, dollars when we were done with it, we had to show the results to the seven families that were investors in Isabella. And then they wrote more checks. And then they kept writing checks. But that... Writing more checks along the way also gave them more comfort, more tangible runway, proof of proposition, and actually was a checks and balances uh, process, so to speak, for their, uh, uh, their ability to finance the company. And so for many of you, who, frankly, all you need to get started is a $50,000 check or a $150,000 check. It is a lot easier to go and get folks to write two $75,000 checks which, by the way, will most likely be convertible notes than it is to go seek an equity disposition from a financial institution. And I'll tell you certainly why the convertible note option, if you don't know, or for those who don't know, is a better, better option um, in a minute. The other thing, though, that obviously people are going to say, so how do I find these people, right? 
And believe me, that becomes the pilgrimage. That becomes the story. That becomes the journey, which is you living your story, your proposition, your business, 24 hours a day. And that is not missing every networking event, not missing any chance to go to alumni events, not missing chances to showcase, <coughs> not missing chances to go to other industries, um, and really talking about how does your business or how does your business opportunity perhaps fit into other business models. So rather than talk about your business model, going to new industries and talking about how your product or solution or your proposition can fit new business models. Those were ways that we got to start spreading more of the, the visibility of our little company and our little vision and attracted folks who were not traditional investors in mobile, but investors in user interfaces, toys, publishing. Because they saw at some point how our technology and our products would be able to have application over the course of the next couple of years into those markets that they were vested in. And so you really need to turn over virtually every leaf and keep turning over leaves over and over again in order to find these people. But I've seen, not only as someone who's written these checks, but as someone who's received these checks, that today over the last 24 months, and probably going at least into the next 24 months, they are the most readily prepared to be investors in your businesses. Now, the reason why we say notes is there's always the challenge of, well, how do I price my company? And so, Many of the, the discussions that you have with yourself folks are, well, what's my company worth? And that really is you know, kind of a humorous discussion because it's really worth nothing. I mean, it's worth <laughs> only what you think you can deploy, make money, and earn, et cetera. Or it's worth your brand and you're, at the time before you even ship a product, probably investing most of your time in the brand and getting recognition and getting partnership. So, What's it worth is really kind of a, 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 a bizarre question that doesn't necessarily have a real answer. And one way then to kind of validate that or to offset that valuation discussion is to structure your deal in a convertible note. And so when you're looking to raise money, it's probably easier if people just loan you the money in what's called a convertible note. And those can be done for a year term, a two year term, whatever it is. It's a private discussion between you and the investor. But what the note does is the note puts off the time to price the, the transaction and puts off the time to price the value of the company. And really, it's the most intelligent way, probably, because you don't have a good answer what it's worth. You'll say it's worth a lot. And the guy with the money will say it's worth a little. Well, that, that sounds like a Mexican standoff. So for me, it's, let's set aside what it's worth today. And we'll make a, an obligation and a commitment to pay you back in a year from now. Or you can convert that note into valuation that's set in a year from now. And when the world has come together, when you will never really have more pieces of the pie to tell what you think the valuation is really worth. And so that's why, again, when you talk about con convertible note, it is an entrepreneur-friendly investment vehicle for financing. And it's one that traditional venture capital guys won't write. High net worth and rich people, they'll write those checks all day long. Now, brain power. Part of it is when I started to put together um, my team, I said to myself, well, I'm an investor and I understand transactions and I'm a lawyer by education and I get it and I think we can sell stuff and all that, but I don't know the risks of PTC or BFCC certification. I don't know how to put stuff in boxes like we talked about. I don't know how code gets you know, burned into nanny flash. I don't know any of that stuff. And I think I'm gonna need all that stuff when I build this thing. And so the reality is, is brain power is still king. And so being able to find the folks who really are the smartest people in your needs category is ideal. And those aren't necessarily people you need to hire full time. They can be 1099, they can be contractors, but there's no substitute for pure brain power. And, and that's not just brain power in, in intellect, it's also brain power in design or it's brain power in creativity. And so really there is no substitute for coming out with the best product or the best proposition or the best service or solution that you can have. And nine times out of 10, it's done with brain power. Apple is not this incredibly powerful company because it's got a bunch of dummies working there. It's clearly driven by the cream of the crop in 
uh, ID, CMF, software engineering, product design, packaging, marketing, etc. And so don't carry these people 12 months a year on your balance sheet if you can't afford them. But find out who they are and see if you can pay for them for four weeks a year or during a critical development cycle or in a prototyping uh, aspect. Ways that you can actually harness them cost effectively and be able to use that in output for you to accomplish your next step, whether it's show the demo, have a prototype built by a, a wizard for just two or three weeks um, and be able to raise money off of that. Those two or three weeks with the person who is the best designer, the best prototype, the, the smartest in your particular field will be well worth the three weeks that you paid for, for him or for her. The next kind of piece that we struggled with was brand. As a consumer company, brand is king. People know all sorts of brands, albeit positive and negative. And so brand for a long part of your journey, the early part of your journey, is really all you have. That's what you're marketing to people. You're marketing to people your brand. I want to be X. X represents this, a product that will kick ass, a product that makes your life easier, a product that will save you money, whatever it is, that product, that service, all of that <coughs> today is represented by this brand that I'm pitching to you or that I'm sharing to you. Because I don't have the product yet, it's not in my pocket, it's not ready, it'll be here, it won't be late, never tell a person you're gonna be late. Um, and it's gonna be awesome and it will over deliver and it'll be underpriced, all, all you can say all that. But it's really wrapped in the brand while you're there. So when you go and pick that initial brand and you, within the first month of starting your business, you really have to understand what you want that brand to represent. What does it really truly represent to you? And that's the only way you'll be able to sell it with conviction to potential employees, potential investors, potential um, customers, potential um, third party partners or alliances. And so in my particular case, my brand is my daughter. And the reason is, is because I did try to come up with a unique, catchy phrase that was techy and mobile. But at the end of the day, you know, it is a, um, you know, kind of a ride and fly type of, of activity when you become an entrepreneur. And I likened my starting my business off at a thousand miles an hour pretty much the same way I started off as being a parent. And the, my daughter arrived, and from there on off, I felt like, you know, the world was moving at a thousand miles an hour. And so that new journey as a new parent for someone who's building mobile communication products for family really was symbolizing to me a new journey. Uh, and again, it was something that I believe that Isabella represents this great, very softer side, very family-based communications company. It's a not an intimidating company, and it doesn't sound <coughs> intimidating. And so all of that we were able to evaluate, explore, and discuss, and at the end of the day, it's with conviction that Isabella hopefully will become one of these great new mobile device companies. So, the keep it simple comment um, came when um, I actually took my device, we actually built a prototype last year, and I took it down to um, Wall Street Journal. I got an appointment with Walt Mossberg, so many of you might know who Walt Mossberg is. He's <coughs> the lead tech editor for uh, personal technology group, for, or personal technology of Wall Street Journal. And he's known as kind of a cantankerous type of guy. He sees everything before everyone else. He's rubbing shoulders with Steve Jobs and all these people. And so I got a meeting with him to go into his office and actually show him the device. And so the device was kind of um, sketchy. It wouldn't power up all the time. And he kind of, everyone may have gone through the little demo failure and you cross your fingers and you can't reschedule on Walt Mossberg. And, so I went down there and I crossed my fingers and I powered it up and it worked. And you know, that was fantastic, it worked. Um, and he actually said, wow, you have a better interface than Kindle. This is fantastic. And so I started telling him about the things I wanted to do with the device. And he stopped and he said, just keep it simple. Like, there's no need for you to add all these other things. Because I thought I wanted to add other things. I wanted to add video. And I wanted to add access to social networks. And I wanted to add this and I wanted to add that. And he said to me, just keep it simple. One of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs during product development make is feature creep. They just innately think they can cram more into it. And they think then that they can get paid more for it. Which, by the way, may or may not be true. The reality is, the 100%, what is true is if you feature creep, it will cost you more to develop. 
And so your OB and your R&D and your engineering numbers go higher and crazier. And yet there's no proof that any of those value-added features that you're putting in there have any meaningful impact on the marketability of the product. And so the keep it simple is the kind of the story. But my mother always said, keep it simple stupid, which many of you may have heard of the KISS. It's kind of as that, uh, that uh, acronym. And my mother was the same story, that she used to always think, she would send notes to Tupperware, she would send notes to all these appliance companies that she got appliances from, saying, keep it simple, stupid, and then she would sign in her name, Wilma. And that's all she did, she would write le like two or three letters a month every time she got something, just providing her feedback. This is back in the day where there was no Twitter, and you couldn't write, keep it simple, stupid, or hashtag, keep it simple, stupid. My mother hand wrote a letter, keep it simple, stupid, Maytag, or keep it simple, stupid, Cuisinart, or, or whatever it was. Whether it was, again, your manual, your user guide, your quick start, any of the kind of experience that you want your, your consumer to, to um, enjoy, you know, what we found time and time again was just try to keep it simple. So one idea is when you finish with your proposition or you write your PRD, product requirement document, or your MRD, your market requirements document, is when you're done with it, you erase the last two. <laughs> Hope that all your ideas are at the bottom, all your good ones. You know, erase the last two and ask yourself, how much money has this actually saved me? How much time might this save me? And then, can I really live without these? And, and I think what you'll find is, is more times than not, you'll be happily, um, uh, or you'll be pleased to find that they'll actually have a nicer reduction in cost savings and it will indeed uh, shorten their time to market. Competition. We always think competition is good. Some people, you know, don't want any competition. Some people, when they pitch me at the firm, they say, well, we have no competition. And I, I automatically know that your company will be a total loser if you come in and tell me that you have no competition. Because that attitude is just not a true attitude. There should be competition. If there is no competition, then we're in trouble. And in fact, the greatest thing for Motorola 15 years ago was Nokia. And Nokia was 10 million in revenue or you know, 15, 20 years ago, and Motorola was billions. And the reality was, is the mobile phone market took off because of competition. And that's probably true of, of every business uh, space. And frankly, some people are fearful that, the, that Apple's innovation pace will reduce because there isn't yet a competition suitable yet to take market share away from the smartphone business or the laptop business. The iPad tablet business is kind of TBD. So competition for us, we embrace. You have to beat it every day. You have to understand what it is. You have to tear it apart. You have to look at engineering aspects of it. But competition, we welcome. The left side is the traditional competition for visit, which is the our device on um, your right is our product. Your left is uh, the competition. Digital photo frames have been around for 10 years. And what the challenge has always been is you have to go to the digital photo frame and stick in memory or stick in a USB or update it. And sometimes it makes honey-do lists. Honey, will you go change the, the pictures on the frame? They're Easter, and this is Halloween, and those kids are now 16, and they're like four. And so all of that you know, kind of sharing um, was a very manual process. And we actually started hearing stories that that some of the folks um, who had parents with these digital photo frames would actually mail the chip, because they didn't want to go over there. If they knew the pictures needed to be changed, they would mail the memory of the chips. Um, and so the competition is one that identifies the pain points, it identifies where is their issues, it identifies where things can be improved and where things can be taken. If there is no baseline, it's hard to actually show incremental value, or extraordinary value creation uh, of your product or your service. So when I show a slide like this, I say, look, yes, that one you have to go drive over and stick it in, or maybe they're a little bit more advanced, they have to use Wi-Fi, and I don't know about you, but my parents don't even really know what Wi-Fi is, and they actually have issues with you know, kind of Wi-Fi. Or this one, which is, I just take a picture of my phone, and I send it to the frame, and it's there to me. It's pretty straightforward. You can't get anything off that frame. That frame actually doesn't share. The minute you stick your stick or your memory into that, 
it's on it. But when you send it into visit, you actually can send the photo off of visit. So it's the first two-way frame ever. So you can actually send photos off it. And so your mom or your wife or your husband or your uncle or your sister is part of the sharing versus the left where the user I call is treated more like an invalid. So embrace your competition, punch it in the nose, tell all your customers that you're going to punch it in the nose, and be able to use it to help highlight and market kind of the strengths and advantages of your proposition. If you say you have no competition, I don't believe you, and I won't write you a check. Pretty straightforward. Now, have you seen one close to yours now? Can you ask questions? Can Turn I ask right? a question, Mr. Browning? Yes. Have you seen one close to yours now, though? Now that it's been out? Um, no, I've not. And, and, and by the way, we'll get to another slide. Uh, I have not yet, but that doesn't mean I don't worry about it. Um, and so, you should always be worried, and we'll get to a slide where I'll tell you exactly how worried I get about stuff. And, and so I do think that that's certainly a big point. Yeah. So this slide says, let PR help product development. And so some people are like, well, when do I announce? When do I actually say I'm coming out with something? When do I announce the product? When do I announce the service? Last week, one of the reasons, you'll see this November 10th, was the date I was supposed to be here, but I was in the deposition. But it was also the day that Isabel announced its second product, which is Fable. Fable is the world's first children's tablet. And we cut our deals with publishers, Hogue Mifflin and others. So we now are the only tablet to sh send your kids <coughs> Curious George, Polar Express, a whole host of great companies. So we're excited. New category, children's tablet should be you know, a great ride when it launches between now and next August. Okay? The reason that we announce early is, is, one, you do need to announce to establish some credibility with your partners. <coughs> That you're not, you know, this fly by night, and that maybe it'll come out, and maybe it'll come out, and maybe people will hear about it. So we wanted to put the stake in the ground that says, look, we are planning it, we are developing it, we will share with you what our plans are, let's schedule a meeting, we'll tell you how far along we are with it. We don't have all the answers, and we'd like you to help us figure out some of the answers. And by setting that nine-month lead time, we're able to kind of create the beginning of a working and a cooperative and a, co a, a collaborative working relationship. But what it also does is, you will see that the minute we sent out and made our announcement, we had uh, thousands of, of stories written and clippings and all the stuff that the PR people track. And you'll see that all of these arrows point to something that we never said. And so you'll see that someone says it will resemble more of a, a grown-up Samsung Galaxy tablet. But above it, you'll, say, you'll see someone wrote, it's not going to be like a Galaxy tablet. And then you'll see someone say, oh, it's, uh, it's going to be rugged. Oh, and it's going to play apps, and it's going to be this, and it's going to be that, and it's going to color bezels. None of those we ever said. But what it tells me is people have started thinking about this. People have identified that perhaps it needs to be rugged, and it needs to have this, and it needs to have that. And now that's helping to contribute to the product development process by getting kind of very real and isolated um, feedback from folks that you wouldn't get if you continued to sit in your own office and try to create and create and create. And so for us, Announcing a product, there is no loss to announcing a, a product early on, in my opinion. Obviously, you can't announce it in four years, although I will tell you that that's what biotech does. They announce stuff in four, eight years away. Uh, but you know, in PR, for startups, take any PR you get as, as advantageously as possible, and feel free to announce ahead of the curve so that you can attract interest, you can build relationships, and you can culminate a better um, kind of a, a plan for moving forward. This says, get rich on being thrifty. So there's no kind of um, uh, award for spending all the money you get as quickly as you can. There's <laughs> only a, how long can I create a runway? <coughs> how long can I make my dollar stretch? And guess what? For you personally, as founders or CEOs and shareholders of these companies, the more capitally efficient you are, the more money you will make on an exit. And the reason is, is if someone buys you, or if you merge, or if you have less ownership, uh, aside from yourself, you don't have 50 owners, and you've been very thrifty, and you've been able to demonstrate how efficient you can stretch a dollar, whether it's in development or marketing or cost of customer acquisition or any of that, I will swear to you that you will be worth more at the end of the day. because. Today, there are a lot of companies that are getting big checks 
and they're blowing through them, and they never learn how to be what's called capitally efficient. If you as a startup start by financing yourself at $220,000 every two months, or every three months, or every four months, and you are very, very thrifty in, in, in how much money you take and how much development you're able to do, that thriftiness will preserve your shareholder value, and you'll be so much happier that you did more by taking less. Because at the end of the day, the less money you take, the more you will owe another company. And so you can get really rich on being very, very thrifty when you grow the company. Now, every day I am scared about something. If, if you as a CEO are not scared, then I don't think you're in it you know, for the long haul. Every day there should be some trepidation and some, some palpitation that you go through um, as you go through your vision. And I have two little stories. The first is, when we started shipping product in May, I, we got a precarious order of four units sent to this mysterious location in a town called Cupertino, California. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, like they just bought four units of ours. And we watched them light up, and over the course of the days, we watched each one go dark. And we knew exactly what go dark means. Go dark means they might have been taken apart, they might have started going, and so for that whole week, we are starting, you're freaking out, like, you know, oh my god, oh my god, they're going to tear apart, we're going to get sued in a day, they're going to come up with the iframe, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, this may be the end of the ride. Um, but as time went on, you know, we, you kind of learn about things like that that come up, that those may be validation points, they're reality checks, they're things that you have to be prepared for. But I think you have to live that fear in order to present a, an appropriate reaction or appropriate response to your team or to your shareholders or to a strategy going forward. The other is this last week, the day I was supposed to be here, the day I was in my deposition, I got a phone call on my voicemail from the VP of Kindle. And sure, it's because he saw me just launched a kid's tablet that 20% of the press called kids Kindle. And so we had a chat. We exchanged a non-disclosure agreement on Monday, and they want to talk. Now, I could get sued next week. I don't know. But Amazon, again, I'm fearful that we have something they want. Either they want it or they want to crush it. And those are things that every day that you, you have to be prepared for. You'll certainly experience um, many failures, and so that's okay. You have to learn to get back up. I know it's a cliche, but you do have to learn to get back up. You have to learn to reposition and repackage the offering. Um, you need to learn how to listen to customers who may point out failures, and you have to be swift and reactive to it. But don't think that you're going to sail through without them. Just make sure you have an infrastructure and a company culture or a go governance culture that will support you once you do fail. Because it will be a once you do fail, not a if you do fail. To me, social networks aren't really in touch. We, we all talk about social networks, and for many online businesses, it is the voice to the customer. It is the voice to a, a, to a, 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 a constituent. But for those of us in the touch business, who make devices, physical pieces, social networks doesn't necessarily help us do anything but talk about our brand. It doesn't actually allow me the chance to enable a customer or prospect to touch my device, to actually see it and share it. And so, if you are in the touch business, don't think that, again, the SEO and the, and the world of, of buying AdWords and all the rest of this is going to be the big first part of your marketing phase. It really should be about doing what we call you know, high touch events, where you invite 20 people to come to an event and you teach them about the product proposition. And you build brand ambassadors in person. You build product ambassadors in person. And you create pop-up stores or pop-up experiences for people to touch and see your product. If you're an online business, I get it. Online services, tweeting, whatever, all the rest of those things, that's fine. But if you are in touch, in the touch business of doing consumables, clothing, apparel, retail, all of that, you really can't rely too heavily on, on the social network aspect. To me, my people are my greatest assets. And so these are the folks that every day provide me with support. They provide me with encouragement. They provide me with criticism. They provide me with input from my customers. They tell me who thinks the product sucks today. They tell me who loves it. And these are the people that you need to make sure that you have even before you refine the product development or put it through final QA 
or before you actually launch it. These are the people who will solve the problems as you look and work on the next phase. And by the way, these are the people really running your business. Because if you're an entrepreneur, you're fundraising. And it is a boat drag. So these people are the people who are really running the business at the end of the day, and therefore extremely important. You also have to believe that you'll succeed, but it's important to keep up how you define success. My success is a bunch of pieces. It's this boy who won a business plan competition at an engineering high school in Boston. He won it, and he won a visit. He was excited because he wants all his friends to send him photos to his visit, which will be in his, um, in his uh, kitchen on his island. And he was excited to get the device. He's never seen it. He heard about it. He thinks it'll be fantastic. Khloe Kardashian, a lot of people know her, she's very, very important. She has one of her devices, and that's great. She tweets about it, and she's you know on TV on the E! channel and all that kind of stuff, and there's a level of success to having a Kardashian use my product, and, and that's great. And in the middle, things like showcasing your product, and at the bottom, having your customer showcase it, like AT&T, who's a big customer of ours. But you need to just understand how you can put together and characterize success. And have a lot of little successes. There is no home run. Until you sell your company for 10x multiple of revenue, there is no home run. There are just a lot of little successes that will allow you to build team momentum, build team culture, um, encourage investors to reinvest or attract new investors so that you can gain more runway. One of the last slides is entrepreneurs are self-help group. A big part of this group is obviously around collaboration and resource sharing and pooling. But entrepreneurs in general, it should be a self-help group. There should be none of this, you know, I don't really want to talk too much about X, Y, and Z. Certainly what's proprietary is proprietary. But even talking about processes and sharing relationships and networking and talking about how things get processed and how back office works, and how efficiencies are created in the operation. Those are tips that entrepreneurs uh, would love to learn, they would love to share, they, they would benefit greatly from. And that camaraderie is important, because if you're doing good and you're getting financed, then there are chances are that the companies you associate yourself with are also probably pretty good, and they might also be worthy of being financed. And so there's that Kuretsu model that exists of being able to share and build and talk about things openly in an environment frequently that I think are great. And then sometimes they're mentor relationships and sometimes they're peer based. But there should certainly always be an ad hoc ability to talk to other entrepreneurs. So now, today, we are in, uh, we're almost three years old. We'll be three in February. And we've shifted to thousands of units. Um, we're launching a new product. Uh, the journey's not any easier. Um, and we have raised over time almost $5 million over the last two and a half years, very similar in the same way. And we could never have raised the, fifth, the $5 million any time in the first year and a half. And it all was about being interviewed. And, and so it, it's something that I've seen and that I've replicated with other companies of ours, other portfolio companies of Red Deer, other friends or colleagues of mine in venture or family offices. And it's been a very, very successful model. And so our journey has just begun. We're excited about you know, kind of where we'll be in the next year from now. And we'll be in Sears and AT&T and Amazon and a whole host of these great places that we believe contribute to what it takes to become a successful mobile device company. But I also want to say that I'm here to also support all of your businesses. And so I don't want, as, as Derek to vouch for, I don't want you to leave here thinking that it is a decent speech and, you know, Good luck, but I gotta go back and do my stuff. If you're up for a discussion or you wanna talk about it or you want feedback or you want recommendations, we're happy to do that because we do that in our community in Boston and we would do that to our communities here in, in Michigan um, as a way to allow entrepreneurs to succeed. Because I think at the end of the day, we are, as a, as a society, we as a community, are gonna be about new businesses created more than older businesses prolonging their existence. So if anyone has any questions, I'm going to answer any of those. Thank you again.
introductions. Uh, I think I'm the only one that knows that sound system, so I'll go back there and until then project. Um, we don't have time for questions, but that was a brilliant talk. Brilliant. It is 10 minutes to, so we got to get around the whole room with introductions in 10 minutes. Uh, don't turn this on. Can you start? Sure. Just project. I'll get the mic going in one minute. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm with uh, Doug Brown Packaging Products. I'm the Vice President of Social Media and a Packaging Engineer all at the same time. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Poole. I'm with Accenture and IT Consulting Company. Um, I'm in their outsourcing group, um, working with a regional bank um, with uh, learning. Hi, I'm Amy Ma. I'm doing the website uh, for uh, publishing children's literature uh, in multiple languages. Uh, I'm Shannon Pointer with Capital Strategies. We have offices in Pokemus and Southfield. And I, I actually help entrepreneurs when, when they leave their jobs, sometimes they, uh, they forget something, and uh, that could be their 401k. And, uh, that's, that's what I help people with. Uh, Shannon Pointer, thanks. Hi, my name is Jim Overbeck, and I'm with 401 Systems, and we write hospital scheduling software. There's a healthcare IT community here in Ann Arbor that I'm looking to connect with. You might have clients that could help me connect there. Um, so Jim Overbeck, 401 Systems. I appreciate the introduction. Kyle Stoof with uh, Ann Arbor Radio, but today I'm a member of Team Back Channel. I'm a member of a group who is uh, raising money this month uh, in efforts uh, to raise money for uh, donations for uh, testicular and prostate cancer. Uh, what we're doing is growing mustaches. Test, test, test. So, if you want to check out the hashtag, it's Team Back Channel, all one word. Uh, you can check out our progress as we're growing uh, mustaches. And if you go to Movember.com, which is just November with the letter M, uh, you can search Team Back Channel and make a donation. Uh, we're close to $1,000 uh, right now. We're at 946 as of this morning. So we blew past our $500 goal, our new $1,000 goal. We're hoping to break through and uh, keep going through the end of the month. So thank you. Uh, I'm Roger Rail. Kyle, I didn't see you last night at the uh, Tweet Up. I wasn't there. You weren't there. Okay. Yeah, people were talking about this uh, mustache thing, growing thing. No, it's only for the end of the month because I'm not sure I can make it. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to have a mustache, and, uh, and the whole time our kids were growing up. And then I shaved it off, and the kids like freaked out. They said, Who is this guy? It took my wife like a half a day to notice. <laughs> and the people that I, you know, had known before who see me without. A mustache. They they kind of say something different about you, but the kids just freak out. Anyway, I help with this and, and a few other uh, networking groups. So um, thanks. Hey, quick quick announcement: We have seven minutes to get through these because it's seven minutes too. So <laughs> my name is Chris Lynn. I'm the owner of Mandy and Handy, and Mandy is my daughter. So it's a company that was named after my daughter. Uh, we're going through a hundred thousand dollar raise right now. We're halfway through. Our deadline is the twelfth uh, of December. I'm Deborah Christine, B2B CFO. If you have a growing company with short cash, rising profits, but lower margins, lots and lots of data, but not much information, I can help by providing just the right level of CFO services for you. Evan Lowry, I work at Sharp Music. If you've read a good marketing book recently, let me know. I'm Gerald Cohn, uh, president of SoftTrek Inc. at SoftTrekInc.com, and I have two patents that I'd like to license, one dealing with tactile interface with computer displays. Uh, hi, my name is Jane Delancey of Delancey Design, and basically we're in the business of making you look good to your customers for your product or service, email, websites, uh, displays, Jane Delancey, DelanceyDesign.com. Hi, I'm Phil Callahan. I'm Director of Communications at the National Center for Manufacturing Sciences here in Ann Arbor. And uh, we help manufacturers um, use R&D to create innovation. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Dents, and I worked with um, Michael Dell, Jeff Hawkins, Mike Lazarides, and a fellow by the name of Bob Crowney. And we helped launch all the first generation wireless devices. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. I take it, Mr. Dan. Uh, it's like, uh, it's not my uglier old brother, that's for sure. 
<laughs> My name is Kevin Malley, uh, Boston native and longtime Boston Red Sox fan. Appreciate the hat. Uh, and I recently retired as a consulting partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers, so I'm now helping smaller businesses mature their processes from startup to next stage. Hello, I'm Jerry Willis of My Self Worth. We connect college students and business professionals, house their online portfolio, and we will be revamping higher education. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tiffany Reisner. I spoke last week on digital marketing. Nice to see you again. Thanks for coming back. Um, let's see. Tomorrow, Weber's is having a free scotch tasting from the folks at the Glen Levitt. So all of you scotch lovers like me can go all the way there from 5 to 7 at Weber's Inn at the Habitat Lounge. Hi, I'm Molly Dargan. I'm a senior at Michigan State and an intern at New Digital Marketing. Hi, my name is Bill Dunn. I'm with MLive.com. Uh, number one fan of Michigan State and State of Michigan. We're located just up the street and we are happen to be looking for a digital advertising sales rep. So if you know of anybody who would be based here in Ann Arbor working in the Metro Detroit area. Grant by Camp, I work in Gen X Digital. Um, we do everything from build websites to SEO, AdWords, analytics. Hi, I'm John Van Nesher. Uh, I've been a CEO of a couple of smaller entrepreneurial companies, and I'm seriously considering uh, joining a startup. Thanks. Hi, I'm Chris Barnum. I work at ProQuest um, here in town, and I'm on the user experience team. I've been an information architect for uh, over 11 years. Hi, I'm Mary Ewell. I work for uh, Boulevard Financial, helping um, companies and individuals secure their financial future. Mark Schisler with Third Screen Gurus. We provide access to the SMS channel to execute marketing and advertising plans. Hi, Mike Nato with Affordable Computers. We help people get rich by being thrifty with their technology and service requirements. Shameless, sorry. <laughs> I'm Wayne Aker, I'm a web developer specializing in uh, the Drupal content management system. Hi, I'm Bob Fran. My company is Bob Fran Photography, and I create images for advertising agencies and corporations around Southeast Michigan. I'm Carter Sherlin from Open Studios and I'm a commercial editorial and portrait photographer. Yeah, that was amazing. It's, we still have two minutes to go. So, <laughs> yeah, so me and I can be long-winded here. No, but uh, seriously, let's give a big round of applause to Matthew Garner. That was I, I'm sure you learned a lot. Uh, maybe you're even inspired to uh, start a startup, right? I mean, it's, it was a very informative, uh, useful talk. And um, so anyways, I'm Derek Merriman, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing, in case you didn't know that. And to my right is the lovely Dee Davey, who's going to finish us off today. I am Dee Davey, Creative Ideas Marketing. I'm an independent marketing contractor, and I help overstretched and under-resourced marketing teams get projects off their desk without the investment of a full-time resource. It's also my pleasure to weekly announce our next speakers and work with Derek on the program. We are taking a break next week for Thanksgiving, so no Lunch Ann Arbor marketing on the 24th of November, but we will be coming back on the 1st of December and we have Ross Johnson, one of the founding members of Lunch and Arbor Marketing, talking about how to make your website more profitable. So see you in two weeks' time, and a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah.